Good morning. Today, we are glad that you are taking a moment to give thanks with us. Now, I invite you to stand and join in our call to worship. Peace and thanksgiving. Worship God with gladness. Come to the Lord with gratitude and joy. God with praise. Come to the Lord with grateful hearts. Love God with humility. Come, worship the Lord. We have come to worship the Lord of sea and sky, the Lord of field and stream, the Lord of all creation. Amen. Please remain standing for the, our opening hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. This is one you all know. Please sing with us.
A psalm of thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations.
Our scripture is from, from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer. Amen. 
the Lord of earth and sky, Lord of hill and vale, of tree and flower, stars, sun and moon. We give thanks for our senses, the eye and the ear, the wonder of creation, of encountering God's intentional, loving creation. For the gift of loving relationships, brothers and sisters, parents, spouses, children, friends, we give thanks. We are called to give thanks at all times and in all places, and sometimes it's easier than others. When things are going well, it's easy to be thankful. Of course, it's also easy to fall into the trap of thinking we're accomplishing it ourselves. When things are going badly, it's easy to wallow in despair, and it's much harder to be thankful, to find silver linings, to find joy that is not just happiness, but the result of being rooted and grounded in God's love, that is the result of knowing that God has his eye on the sparrow, and surely watches me. That nothing happens in creation that God is unaware of. But that's a different claim than saying God causes everything. One of the foundations of my faith is that God wills good for us. I shared a couple weeks ago on All Saints Sunday some of the stories of my ancestors, particularly my grandparents. And to my surprise, I got a little emotional that day, and I wasn't expecting to. I've told those stories and sermons before, and they hadn't caught me. But that day it did. And so I didn't tell a story I was planning to, because I was already fairly emotional. But I think it's an important part of my witness and my ministry to let people know that the first pregnancy Rob and I had was a miscarriage. And I still mourn that, even though I now would not change it. I would not change it. I would not undo that because of the timeline. We wouldn't have Ian, and I wouldn't trade him. But every now and then, that will still catch me. And yet, increasingly, I think I'm able to live in joy to take the good and the bad, to take the sorrow and find joy in it. Last week I told you a little bit about Julian of Norwich. She lived in the 14th century, a time of the Black Plague, of the Hundred Years' War, when the dominant theology was that God was angry and distant and God wanted the suffering that the people were going through. And I invited you to take a hazelnut as a symbol of God's love because in one of Julian's visions she's having this conversation with Christ. And in many of her visions, many of her visions, he is suffering greatly. He's on the cross. He's bleeding. She describes in rather gruesome detail the blood. But another vision she sees Mary, his mother, or converses with the risen Christ. And one of those, she becomes aware that she's holding something small, about the size of a hazelnut, she writes. And she wonders what it is, how it exists at all. And it exists, Christ tells her, because I love it. It symbolizes for her all of creation, everything that was or is or will be. In a small, fragile thing. How great trees emerge from small seeds. Over and over in Scripture, the image of the seed is used as a symbol for God's kingdom. 
as a call to participate in God's kingdom. To recognize the fragility of it and to find joy that it exists at all. That we exist at all. That God loves us and wishes us to be. I think sometimes we lose sight of how radical a claim that is as opposed to many of the other religions and cultures of human history, particularly the human cultures and empires and theologies that were dominant in the ancient Near East as the Hebrew people came to their understanding as Christianity began out of those Jewish roots. To claim that God loves that God wills creation, that it is good, is a radical, and if we claim it, a transformative understanding. We're not an accident. We're not a distraction. We are God's own self creating space that creation might exist, that God might express God's love. Julian writes, True true thanking is to enjoy God. Gratitude is a true understanding of who we really are. With reverence and awe, we turn ourselves around towards the walk that God, the work that God leads us to do. Enjoying and thanking with our real selves. We understand ourselves to be God's intentional creation. We understand ourselves, in Wesley's term, to be surrounded by God's grace. That everything we can do is because of the gift of God's grace. We see ourselves as God's children and we respond, not just to God, but to the world. Julian's visions were transformative. They picked up again this theology of love and goodness that is present throughout the Scriptures, but so often we set it aside and we fall into the ways of the world of violence and power and control and coercion. It reintroduced to the West a theology that had never died out in the Eastern Orthodox Church. The understanding that God wishes us to be healed, to be made whole. It's a very different understanding than punishment and escape. And for me, it has been transformative. For me, that is the message of the harvest. Last week we prayed that God would send workers into the harvest, that we would understand the depth of God's love, that we would share it with the world. Truly, a harvest can't happen unless a seed falls to the ground and dies and breaks open. The earth is renewed through the seasons. There's a cycle to life. and We are called to participate in that cycle. Sometimes I think our modern world, we've gotten so far away from the rhythms of nature. Now I'm a night owl. I love the invention of the, the electric light. I'm really glad that I don't have to rise at, what, 5.30 when the sun comes up and go to bed at 5 when the sun goes down. But there is a rhythm to the world. It's not been that long ago that the only things we would eat would be things that were grown nearby seasonally. Now we can go to the superstore and get strawberries anytime we want. I think maybe... We've come to lack appreciation for the gifts of the earth because we can just demand them. And we lose track of what it takes to provide that bounty, that harvest, the rhythms, the idea that things are special in their own time. I'm not saying we should reject all of the benefits of the modern world, but Maybe we should be thankful. Maybe we should give thanks. Maybe we should be more intentional about recognizing the gifts that our time has brought, that we can bring in food from all over the world, that we can always get 
those specialty crops. I talked a little bit about grief. And I've had more conversations with people since I did this, and so I wanted to circle back to it. This understanding of grief is not something that we want to escape from or get over, but it is something that changes through our lives. And when something first happens, the accident, the diagnosis, the loved one dies, it's as if we're in a room with a button and the grief is this ball that just fills the room and everything hits that button and causes pain. And we need to give people space to be there when they're there. But so often our culture wants people to get over grief. You know, you've had your weeks or months, maybe your first year, and now you're supposed to be over it. And I've had some really important conversations with people. We're not supposed to be over our loved ones. But what happens is that grief shrinks, and less and less does that button get pushed, And increasingly, when that button does get pushed, there's joy imbued with it. We remember the stories. We remember the moments. We remember what it is we loved about that person. And we are charged, I believe, with taking that and sharing that with the world. That goodness, that love, that peace of our lives that they gave us. We hold, we mourn, we celebrate, we share. That too is the harvest. That too is how we stay connected with the great cloud of witnesses. How we remind ourselves who we are. And how we transform grief, not get over it, but transform it into part of the grounding that we have in a God who knows what it is to be human, knows what it is to weep for a friend, knows what it is to be treated unfairly, to suffer, to die. And yet, gives us the opportunity to know that suffering and death is not the end of the story. To give thanks for the God of life that transcends suffering and death. Our psalm today is one of the most joyful psalms in the scripture. Five verses long, but there are seven imperatives and insurances that we are God's children, that we are his sheep, part of his flock, that we are invited to go into the gates, to make a joyful noise. It's literally in the Hebrew, it's shout. That moment of excitement. You know, later today when the Chiefs score that winning touchdown, we'll shout. We're invited to do that in worship. That's what worship is, is to that excitement, that moment of exaltation, of joy that we can't contain. We're invited to worship. But worship isn't something we go to and then we go do other things. Worship is how we live our lives. We come into the presence of God. We become aware that we are always in the presence of God. That there is no height or depth that we go to that God is not with us. We come to know God. To be still and know. Not just an intellectual ascent, but a relationship. An active awareness of that presence. And then we can enter into His courts. We can recognize His sovereignty. Sometimes this Sunday... The last Sunday of the Christian year before Advent starts next week is known as Christ the King Sunday. We assert that Christ has sovereignty. That Christ is ultimately in control. We enter into His courts with praise, with thanksgiving. We give thanks and we bless His name in all that we do. Not merely words we mouth on a particular hour, on a particular day, but how we live our lives. That's what the psalmist calls us to. And the psalmist calls all the world to that. Not just his tribe, not just his nation, but all the world. Because God is the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer. God's love transcends our understanding. God's loving kindness is eternal. 
to all generations, the psalmist tells us, God is with us. That is a transformative knowledge. We can let go of our own selfishness, our own greed. The idea that we have suffered in ways no one else ever has, we can let go of those things and enter fully into the joy of God's presence. Into the joy of knowing and sharing God's love. Something we can't control or contain, but are called to share. That is the God I believe is revealed in the Scriptures That is the God that is revealed over and over in the mystics. People who have dedicated their lives to knowing and praising and thanking and living in witness of God. Who recognize our fragility. Who recognize the bounty in simple things. The cycle of the harvest. The witness over and over is that God is love. Other theologies that talk about God's anger and distance and punishment almost inevitably lead to earthly power for the one proclaiming it. If we are to follow Christ who humbled Himself, who did not cling to divinity but humbled Himself, obedient even to death on a cross, it's not about our power. It's about what Christ has done for us. At every stage of life, we are called to bear witness to that love, to grow into that love, to recognize that we will never fully understand it. But we have been given the most precious gift, God's own self. We are called to share that gift with all of the talents and time and all the treasure that we are given. When we're young, when we're old, when we're parents, when we're children. When we become aware of how connected we are to generations past and generations to come. Always we are to dwell in that grace and that love. I showed this picture to the youth group this morning. We had a a pretty fascinating conversation about freedom and rights and service. I loved how one of the kids phrased it. They broke the pie rules. There are rules and they violated the rules. Now, many in our culture, I think, would defend this saying, hey, they only took their fair share. They didn't take any larger piece. But they, they exercised their right and their choice in a way that impacted others negatively. It's a minor thing, but there's injustice here. Now, I'm told that some people actually like the crust. I'm generally not one of those, but you've got to take your piece. You don't get to exercise your rights in a way that harm others. It's a simple thing, but I think we lose sight of that sometimes. As we gather around Thanksgiving tables, as we bicker over politics and sports and whatever else it is that comes up, we as Christians are called to follow Christ in all that we do. That doesn't mean we become doormans. Christ, after all, flips a few tables. But we are called to live our life in service and trust that God's justice ultimately provides. That God's justice provides ultimately is victorious, and that God's justice is made known in grace and love. Not shame and punishment, but grace and love. And love doesn't mean you just get away with it scot-free. Have you ever become aware of your own sinfulness in something? And sometimes it's worse. I remember a time when, when I was a kid... My best friend and I had gone to Town East, which was far, far away from where we were allowed to ride our bikes. And then one of us, I don't remember which one, I think it was me, but one of us got a flat tire. So we couldn't get home by dusk. And of course, this is long before cell phones. 
and no, we didn't think to bring a quarter. We're trying to figure out how to handle this. And in all, all fairness, we handled it pretty well. We stayed together. We started walking. We figured out which friend's house was closest. We got to the friend's house. We called our parents. Of course, by now, it's like an hour and a half after we're supposed to be home. They're beside themselves. I'll never forget, my friend's father had a big station wagon. He came to pick us up. And we were braced. We were ready to be yelled at. We deserved to be yelled at. Ken thanked our friend's parents for helping out, loaded our bikes in the car, and drove home. That silence was far worse than the yelling. We got to sit there and stew in what we knew we had done wrong. He dropped me off and sent me into my mother. He took my friend home. It was far, far harder to not hear the yelling because I knew. My friend's dad loved me deeply. He became a father figure to me after my dad left. And he taught me a great deal about what it is to be a man and live a life of faith and love. He didn't need to tell me how badly I'd screwed up. I knew. What he denied me was the opportunity to externalize it, to make it his fault. I think ultimately that's how God treats us. We know, God knows, God doesn't need to yell at us or torment us. God just lets us stew in it. The Apostle Paul had been so full of himself, so sure he had the right answers, he went to impose them on others. And we've talked before about that incredible experience he has on the road to Damascus, a light, a voice, why do you persecute me? Days of silence, of blindness, of ultimately being dependent on the very ones he had gone to persecute to bring him into communion, to baptize him, to help him see God's love and to share it with others. Paul spends the rest of his life doing that. Much of the New Testament is the result of Paul forming communities and writing with them, sometimes quite angrily, trying to work out this balance between grace and love and justice and right answers and getting frustrated when somebody just doesn't see how right you are. But holding that loosely and recognizing that you might not be as right as you think you are. Or as I've preached before, that other people's paths might just be different. Because of his transformation, because of his work, because of his bold proclamation that Jesus is Lord, meaning Caesar is not, Paul spent a good portion of his life in prison. And he came to see that as joyful. Some of his most profound conversions, the time when he most deeply affected another person's life was of his giving joyful witness in times when he was suffering, when he was locked up, when it was uncertain whether he'd live till morning. His bold witness changed people's lives. Our letter to the Philippians that we read a portion from today is one of those prison letters, and yet it is the most joyful he has. Rejoice, I tell you. Rejoice in the Lord always, in all things. Whether things are going the way you want them to or not, rejoice in the Lord. Ground yourself in His presence. And whatever is, I think this may be one of the times when Paul most gets it. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, whatever it is that you encounter, there's room there for different understandings, but there's also a call, a challenge. Pleasing to whom? All of this list, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, is seen in the light of Christ. Is it pleasing to Christ? Is it commendable before Christ? 
Does it echo God's justice? Not our own. Christ, the risen Christ, is still sitting on that beach, still inviting us to breakfast. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Can you feel that little bit of irritation? We've been over this, Jesus. I'm done, right? No, we're not done. Because our call is to become Christ-like. And if Christ is who He says He is, if Christ is who we believe He is, the fullness of God made flesh, the transcendent, eternal God entering into our finitude, living a fully human life, showing us what it is to be fully human, and then when we turn away and reject Him and crucify Him, still loving us, still living, coming out of the tomb again to invite us into wholeness, If our call is to be like Jesus, we're never done. But by God's grace, it is possible that we can take the next step. Think about these things, Paul writes. Center everything that you do. Joyful, sorrow, everything in Christ. And the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding will dwell with you. My wife will tell you, I'm not there yet. One of the things I realized yesterday is I get grumpiest when I'm about to preach about joy. And I think it's because I'm convicted of how far I fall short I fall. The fullness of joy, Julian writes, is to behold God in all things. To recognize our shortcomings and to rededicate ourselves. To be thankful, to be thanksgiving And all that we do, and all that we are, that's what I believe. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is, Come ye thankful people, come. Number 694 in the hymnal.
sorrow free from sin bear forever purified in thy presence to abide come with all thine angels come raise the glorious harvest home we have a number announcements to share. Uh, Pat wants to share the choir will be singing for the worship service next week as we begin Advent. There'll be a very short practice after church today and I don't have them in the right order but uh, eh, I got them in the wrong order. Following the service today one of the reasons the choir practice will be short is that we'll be decorating for Christmas. You've probably seen things coming out of the closets already and you are invited to stay and help with that if you'd like. Uh, Don and Jean want to share that their son, Doug, uh, who's been battling cancer, got permission to travel to Kansas for Christmas. His white count is getting better and had his last chemo and radiation last week, so celebrate for that. Zach and Leslie Reynolds want to share that they are happy to announce the birth of their granddaughter, Tilly Marie Reynolds, on the 17th, uh, eight pounds, five ounces. So we celebrate with Zach and Leslie and Tilly. And uh, Deanne Davis is asking for prayers for a positive board of review for her son, Lee Davis. His uh, Eagle Scout is being reviewed tomorrow. So that is a major accomplishment, and we look forward to celebrating that with him. I'm sure he will do well. And uh, I'll scroll back. The other things I wanted to share, um, there will be a special charge conference. And some of our leadership goes, we just got done. I can feel that way. But there will be a special charge conference Monday, December 6th at 7 p.m. The sole item on the agenda, the only thing we're allowed to discuss, is you may be aware that Boy Scouts of America is in bankruptcy and that we are a longtime charter member. Uh, back in October of 2020, at the Great Plains Conference's dis uh, direction, Pastor Steve Cole filled out a proof of claim form that enables us to vote on the eventual settlement. Uh, I won't get into the details, but there's... For decades, BSA said, if there's anything that you know, goes wrong, we get sued, we will indemnify the charter organizations, and then they went into bankruptcy and didn't. And so the United Methodist Church and the Lions Club in particular are two of the largest charter organizations and said, wait a minute, and so we're involved in the settlement. We will get details of what they proposed uh, probably this week on the 24th, they say, right before Thanksgiving. Um, we will send as much information out as we can, and I'll have a handout probably on the 5th at church. And then any member that would like to come and vote on that uh, on the 6th at 7 o'clock, we'll have a chance to give our input. And the conference will be giving us quite a bit of advice. Um, my intention is to follow their advice. They've got some very good lawyers working on this. So it shouldn't take very long to go through this, but I did want to give uh, notice that we will be doing that. Six o'clock, excuse me, seven o'clock on December 6th. One more chance to sign up for my Advent Lactio groups. Uh, 11 o'clock Tuesday morning or 6 p.m. Tuesday night. We'll be entering deeply into some of the scriptures of the season, and I'd love to have a few more people. We keep it to a very small group, and it'll be 30, 40 minutes long, but uh, would love to have a few more people participate in that. And there are sign-up boards out at uh, either exit. And we are kicking off our fundraising for the uh, Appalachian Service Project, the mission trip that uh, we do each summer. I'm looking forward to going on that uh, next June. And we decided we would ask people to sponsor miles. It's about 1,800 miles round trip. And if we had people sponsor all 1,800 of those miles at $4 a mile, we'd cover the cost. So this is your challenge to do that. Uh, we'll be getting a, a map to track our progress up uh, out in the narthex here pretty soon. And then, as I mentioned, uh, hanging in the greens after the service. Let us take all of that work of the church and all of the joys that were shared in our announcements to God in prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for births, for medical treatment, for the hard work of achieving Eagle Scout, we give you thanks for the freedom to gather, to enjoy the fruits of the earth, 
to spend time with family and friends. We give you thanks for the luxuries of modern life. And we ask that you would ground us deeply, that we would appreciate so much that we take for granted, that we would see each other with your eyes, that we would see you ever more fully in the midst of all that we do. We pray these things in the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of the one that shows us the way. And we continue in prayer with the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father. Are, scheduled, are placed around the building and again express my thankfulness for the pledges received and for your generous giving that enables all that we do here at First UMC. Giving God, we give you most humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, 
and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Give us such an awareness of your mercies that our hearts may be thankful and that we may shout forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom and with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is now Thank We All Our Gods, number 102 in the hymn. in our hearts. We are admonished to let our gentleness be known to everyone. To do all that we do in supplication and thanksgiving that we might know the fullness of the peace of Christ that transcends all understanding. 